Let's give a mega hand for Antti Jussi Suominen. Okay, thank you very much, Iro. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for the very uh, warm welcome. Uh, my name is Antti Jussi Suominen, and uh, I'm here to, uh, today to talk about building online business, as the, uh, the program says, but I, I did some edits. And as you can see, I edited, uh, I added the word new, so building new online business, and also added uh, the qualifier in large companies. And uh, when I talk about myself and what I've done in the beginning, it will be very uh, obvious to you why I added those words, because that's what I've been doing most of my time, most of my professional life. And, uh, and if there's one thing that I have some thoughts on, some learnings on, it's probably that topic, how to build new business uh, inside large companies. But I also thought that, uh, that I would uh, have this subject uh, because may, some of you may, may consider becoming an entrepreneur or, or other career options. And uh, as many large companies right now are, are facing the issues that they don't really know what's happening in the world. They don't know how to grow. Many of the large company top lines are pretty flat and they're looking for new ways of growth. Uh, they're, they're turning uh, more and more towards startups and they're also uh, uh, doing uh, new business creation, trying to learn how to do new business creation uh, inside these large com companies. So it is uh, a career option also for people thinking of doing entrepreneurship, but in a large company environment. So I thought it might be interesting, at least to some of you. So what am I going to be talking about? I'll talk about myself first. That's always fun. I'll try and keep it very short. Uh, if I'm if I'm rambling too much, then just sort of say, move on. And then uh, as the second topic, uh, I think uh, I want to share with you uh, how BBVA, the current company I'm working for, uh, is um, building new business, how they have solved the, the question of uh, how to actually uh, find out about what's happening uh, in their environment and how to grow the top line. So I'll, I'll use that as a case study. I'll also talk from the venture perspective from the small company perspective, perspective i.e. how Holvi then works uh, inside this large corporation and uh, how we leverage each other. So, about myself, I do have other shirts than this, but because it's the official company shirt, I'm wearing it uh, uh, for, uh, for this presentation. I am 48 years old, uh, which kind of qualifies me already to start uh, uh, teaching younger people, uh, you know, how to do things and how things really are, I'm kind of approaching that age. I still don't get offered a seat at public transportation, but I'm sure that that will happen in a couple of years' time. But 48 years old, I am uh, from Otaniemi. Uh, I'm a, I'm a diploma engineer, master of science in uh, in electrical engineering. So I graduated from uh, from Sähkö Osasto, from uh, the Department of Electrical Engineering in uh, 1993. I did my master's thesis on uh, uh, location-based services uh, on mobiles at a time when mobiles did not have GPSs. So we were basically trying to build services based on the, the cell ID and the you know positioning uh, through the cell towers. It was also the time uh, when I graduated when TCP IP was something that the Americans had invented and people were kind of going, ah, you know, it's not enough. It's not fulfilling all of the different levels of the OSI model. And uh, email could only be sent inside organizations. So, you know, if you wanted to send an email to an outside organization like we did in, in, in my company, then uh, every once in a while you needed to use X400 and uh, the X400 addressing is, is a nightmare. But anyway, that's, that's when, I, when I was in Otanemi. So I don't really remember much about the actual technology stuff and I think it's, it's not even relevant anymore. Uh, in you know, in, in today's uh, day and age. But I did learn a couple of other things and I'll share those with you. Uh, I am currently the CEO of Holvi, and I'll tell you a little bit about Holvi uh, in, the, in the coming uh, presentation, so more about that later. So, as I said, I've, most of my, or 
actually all of my um, uh, professional life I've worked in for uh, large corporations. So I started, I, I did my master's thesis for, uh, I think it was called Posti Teleden, which then turned into Telecom Finland, which then turned into Sonera. And I started there, uh, I, I did my master's thesis in 1993. I started working there. I worked uh, in the mobile uh, mobile services department. There was a guy by the name of Matti Makkonen who ran that, who used to throw young people uh, that he saw promise in into cold water. In other words, he gave them projects that were way larger than what they were. Uh, that happened to me as well. We, we worked on something called uh, Mobicentrex. Uh, we, we basically built a mobile switch um, uh, from scratch and uh, used that to provide um, switching services, sort of uh, centric services for, uh, for small companies. Uh, we started with Electrobit with the Juha Holko and the guys and, uh, and then it was productized into a product that I found, surprise, surprise, on uh, Sonera's page still. So they're still offering that service. I then moved on to, uh, to be the head of a uh, uh, corporate R&D unit, and uh, and then after that, I joined one of the spearheads of Sonera's internationalization strategy called Zed, and Zed was really an MBA of international services business for me. Uh, I was uh, around 30 years old when we started that. One of the first guys who joined the team, and then for the for the um, uh, next four years, did did a lot of uh, rolling out services globally. I then moved uh, to Nokia uh, in, in 2005. Nokia was very much about uh, doing things in global scale, uh, trying to do new things, trying to build uh, new stuff in, inside Nokia. It was, in my case, a lot about portfolio management. I ran the internal ventures portfolio for Nokia for a little while and then focused on one of the uh, uh, three uh, strategic growth areas that Nokia defined uh, and, and then led that uh, effort. Then in 2012, I, I, we moved back to Finland uh, with my family. Nokia had taken me to the US, so we moved back to Finland. I joined Elisa with the intention of building an uh, international consumer business from scratch again. Uh, I happened to uh, have assigned a, a project called Sulake. Elisa had uh, invested into Sulake from, the, from early on, from the beginning, and they needed to decide what to do with it. Well, we decided to go all in and buy the company as part of the internationalization efforts, and I became the CEO in 2013. And the next four years were really a masterclass in general management. I worked with my team uh, uh, to turn around the business that had been on the decline for, uh, for a number of years. And, uh, and was really sort of redefining, restructuring uh, the way this uh, gaming business that had been around for 15 years uh, was running. And then last year, uh, I was approached uh, by some people at BBVA, and uh, they asked me that, that there was an opportunity to, to join Holvi and become the CEO of Holvi. Would I actually want to do that? And uh, I did a bit of research and uh, found out about how Holvi, uh, sorry, how BBVA does uh, new business, how they approach new business uh, inside this large corporation and was quite impressed. So I thought, yeah, why not? Then met the people at Holvi, found out that they're a, a cool bunch and uh, fun to work with and then joined the company in the beginning of, uh, of this year. So what have I been doing? Uh, all of these years. Uh, I tried, and this is a, a, a diagram that I drew myself, so you can see that it's a little bit, you know, not perfect, but uh, but the work that, that we've been doing is, is never perfect either, so, so it kind of uh, reflects that as well. There are, there's a, like a 360 view of, of what, what I've been doing uh, uh, when developing new business inside large corporations, starting from product development, as I said, we did this customer prototyping in, in Sonera. We started there. Uh, Done acquisitions, so we acquired uh, uh, Sonera. Done also divestments. That's part of running a portfolio inside a large corporation. Sometimes strategy changes. You have things that are moving along quite nicely. The, st the big company strategy changes, and then all of a sudden your, uh, your uh, business isn't as, uh, as interesting as it was from a strategic point of view. And I'll touch one of those uh, things later as well. Um, did portfolio management, as, as I said, at Nokia. Business development and partnerships uh, front, I think that the biggest thing that, that we did at Zed was we uh, I negotiated a deal with Yahoo 
to buy 15% of, uh, of Z and, and actually uh, then <clears throat> to acquire the rest of it. That deal never went through, so, so you know, it was, a, it was a good learning lesson, but, uh, but didn't materialize in, 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 in Yahoo then finally buying Z. And I've also been on, on a couple of uh, uh, divested uh, company boards uh, trying to build business together with, uh, with other large companies. So a lot of different things, a lot of different angles uh, to building a new business inside these, uh, these, these corporations. So I promised I would touch upon what did I learn at, in, in Otaniemi. Uh, I learned a lot of stuff about electronics, dynamic field theory, nuclear physics, and all of that. But I, I honestly don't remember much about that and haven't honestly used <clears throat> much of that in my, in my professional life. However, the things that I learned and, uh, and the things that, uh, that I have used in my professional life were kind of more uh, immaterial. First of all, all of the group work that, that you need to do in order to, you know, to pass the grades, all of the different exercises, all of, all of that uh, taught me one thing, which was that, that you, know, you don't need to know everything yourself. You don't need to do everything yourself. Actually, there's very little that you can do only by yourself. You need to work with others. And, and, and that's really, really important, I think, in today's, uh, in today's life. The second thing is hard work and persistence. There are things that I thought I would never, ever learn and understand. And through hard work, you actually learn difficult things like dynamic field theory, which I still think is a little bit of a magic, magical thing. But, but uh, you, can, you can really learn stuff by, by working hard at it and being persistent and continuing and continuing. I remember the electronics uh, exams that I was taking over and over and over again. And finally, I passed. And I think, in, in general terms, life is a long distance run. It's not about sprints. It's not about being able to pass exactly this test or that test or that exam. <clears throat> it's about continuously working towards your goal and actually um, making, making things happen. And the, the, the third thing, which is in bullets, friends make a difference. I think that, that especially uh, those of you who study here and, and make friends here, uh, at least for me, it happened so that I've kept the same friends all through, all through my personal life. And they've been a lot of help in different uh, parts of, uh, of my personal life and professional life. So friends really do make a difference. So do, do uh, get friends and, uh, and, uh, and, and keep those friends with you. And the, the few really important things from that 360, again, distilled into more uh, immaterial things is, <clears throat> I think with these three things, you can do just about anything. First thing is learn fast. Learn fast and actually learn faster because things are changing. And some people say that change is constant. It's the only thing that's constant, but it's actually not constant. It's actually accelerating. So things are ha uh, changing faster and faster and faster. And I think that the faster you learn, the faster you can, you can uh, get things uh, understood, uh, you know, the better you will be. And, uh, and, uh, but also, you just don't learn. Learning in itself is, is, is not enough. What you need to do is you need to improve continuously what you're doing. So I keep telling <clears throat> my, my children that uh, it's not a shame that you don't know something right now. But if it's something that you really need and you really aspire for and you, you've not made any progress in the next six months, that's a shame. So, so you can start from, from really low. You can, you can be the, the last guy on the team, but if you really want to be the first guy on the team, you need to make progress. And it's also, you know, it, it has, uh, it kind of gives a little bit of mercy as well, because <clears throat> it tells you that you don't have to be the best. You just have to be better than yesterday, worse than tomorrow. And I think it's really important in terms of, again, in terms of in, in your work life, uh, to move forward continuously based on those learnings. And finally, the third thing, be forgiving. Uh, of course, you have to be demanding uh, to yourself and to your peers and you know, to get stuff done. You, you need, really need to have that pain. But actually being uh, forgiving, being able to forgive yourself 
for failing because you're going to fail, especially if you're going to do new business, and particularly if you're going to do new business in large companies. There are going to be failures that don't have nothing to do with you. Maybe the business have been, has been going great, but as I said, if strategy changes, then you know your business is out the door. So you need to be forgiving uh, to yourself and to others, and, and, and that way you'll control the amount of stress that you have. So that was about me. Short and to the point, I hope. Uh, in terms of <clears throat> the case study, I'll now tell you why I think, why, w I, why I was attracted to BBVA, why do I think that BBVA is doing something, if not perfectly, at least in the right direction, and better than most companies that I've, uh, I've so far uh, experienced. Well, first, let's look at what is happening in the financial industry. I don't know how many of you know financial industry, how many of you work, have worked in financial industry or, uh, or have followed financial industry. But what is happening <coughs> excuse me, is that, uh, on one hand, uh, regulators are, are uh, uh, controlling uh, the, the banks in, in their capability to make money. If you remember what happened in 2008, and if you look at the chart here, in, in 2007, the return on equity, which is one of the, one of the measures of, uh, of banks' uh, efficiency, uh, was, this is a, this is a, a, a sort of a, a peer group uh, average, it was around 15%. And if you think about return on equity, it's got return, i.e. how much you make money in the numerator, <coughs> and equity in the denominator. So what happened in this crisis, uh, all of a sudden uh, banks' capability to create uh, revenue out of their balance sheet went down. And then what happened, it bounced a little back, but then the regulators with, with different Basel Accords started to grow the denominator. In other words, they said you need to have more equity less <clears throat> leverage, less uh, loans, more equity in your balance sheet. So more of your own money to avoid for the, for the banks to, to go down. And at the same time, central banks have been keeping the, the numerator, the, uh, the, the returns, uh, artificially low. In other words, the interest rates have been artificially low. So the return is smaller in the numerator and the denominator, uh, the, the e uh, equity required is larger. So in other words, return on equity goes down. It's kind of as simple as that, if you oversimplified like I did. At the same time, uh, regulators are saying, hey, you know what? We're going to open the whole market to competition. So we're going to allow everybody to come in. So first we're telling you, <clears throat> you can't make as much money as you did before. And then we're going to say, everybody can come in and uh, start hitting those profit pockets that you have inside your value chain and, uh, and start chewing at them. And of course, the idea is to increase competition, which everybody thinks is a good thing. Competition increases efficiency, and, uh, and, and efficiency is always good, especially for uh, consumers and, and companies. <coughs> uh, so the entrance, when regulators are opening this market, for example, through uh, uh, the Payment Services Directive number two, which is going to be in effect next year, what's going to happen is that a lot of small companies, a lot of fintechs are allowed to use the most uh, coveted asset, the oil of this industry, which is customer data, and to build uh, their services on top of that. But it also means that large companies can do that. So if you look at the brands, you see brands like Facebook, uh, Google there, so they're also going to be able to enter and attack uh, the, uh, the financial industry <clears throat> and build their services on top of that uh, oil. And that's not enough. Then the third thing that's going to happen are these little squares, which is that there's a, there's a, a wealth of new uh, software technology that is emerging from other industries that can be leveraged to offer better services. So things like artificial intelligence, things like uh, biometrics, things like blockchain, that are all of a sudden changing the landscape. So regulate, regulation on one hand is constricting banks, on the other hand it's, it's allowing more competition, and then technology is creating even more disruption. 
So you can imagine that people who are trying to figure out what's going to happen this year, let alone next year or the year after that, are, are really debating what's going to happen. Nobody knows. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's sort of open. And, uh, and I, I, I chose this quote from, uh, from a colleague's presentation. I stole it from there because I think it's <clears throat> this is exactly the dilemma that big companies face with small companies and small companies face with big companies. So the startups are looking for distribution. And if they get to the distribution fast enough, then they'll become the unicorns. So if they've got a great idea and they open up distribution, you know, they're, they're quick enough to do that before anybody else, then they're going to be first to market and, and they're, they're going to take the market. At the same time, the large companies have the distribution. So if they get innovation somehow, then they can leverage their distribution and push that, uh, that, uh, that innovation through their distribution channel. So one has one, the other has the other asset. And these two uh, sort of entities, or these two, two sort of almost enemies, are, are, are fighting for who gets to be in the sun first. So the way uh, BBVA is solving this is, is uh, they've, they've got a unit called uh, New Digital Business Unit. And uh, why is there a unit? Why is there a spe uh, special unit for this new business? Why is there a special unit to find out what's really going to happen? Because today always wins uh, tomorrow in prioritization, in, in large companies, in small companies. Even in, in our small holy company, we're talking about stuff that needs to happen now, not tomorrow. So if the big company requires something to happen today, it's always going to be at the expense of what's going to happen tomorrow. It's also natural to resist the new. There will be people who are conserving what is, what is currently there, who are polishing the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the surface of the business and making it shinier and shinier. And then there are people who want to change things. And you can't have them both do the same thing. You need to have the, the conserva uh, conservers running the business that's currently bringing in the money, and then you need to have the changers uh, create something new. And, and these uh, polishers are, are naturally going to resist the new. And if you don't cannibalize yourself, somebody else will. In other words, these new businesses that are looking for distribution, these startups, they will absolutely get to that distribution at some point, or one of them will. The problem with, uh, with startups is, as one uh, colleague in a, in, a, in a bank said, there are so many of them. None of them are scary from a big bank's point of view alone. But it's the death of a thousand cuts that the big beasts are afraid of. They, they are worried that a thousand little profit pockets are going to be sucked dry by these new incumbents who are doing something better, more efficiently, more customer friendly, leaving the big carcasses of, of these uh, big corporations sort of uh, empty because they don't anymore have the business they used to have. So you better do it yourself. And, uh, and, and finally, as I said, the changers need to be in a different place from the conservers. They need to be slightly shielded, not completely separated. There needs to be uh, sort of an exchange between, uh, between these, two, these two groups. And there's a, there's a term called boundary spanners, people who can move between these two uh, entities that are really, really important in this. And so what does, what does uh, NDB get from uh, BBVA, from the big company? Reputation, assets, and expertise. There's a lot of expertise inside BBVA that, this, uh, for, for example, the portfolio companies like ourselves can leverage in terms of risk management, in terms of, uh, of, of new business models. And similarly, uh, NDB uh, helps the bank in, uh, in, in de-risking the future, in building new revenue. So this is not charity. It's supposed to bring that uh, growth in top line. Capabilities and learning, lear learnings and sandbox for experiments. Big banks with their uh, big reputable brands can do all of the risky things that smaller, th uh, smaller uh, companies and smaller entities can. 
Uh, but at the same time, the, the brand of trust can be leveraged uh, for these smaller uh, portfolio companies. Uh, one question. Yes? Can you also include market access, so access to customers there in the, uh, those three reputation assets? Yes, yes, most definitely. The uh, 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 market access, as I said, the distribution the big banks have, uh, when they have it, I mean, in, in the markets that they have it, absolutely, it's part of the assets. Yes, good point. So, how does BBVA do with this? It's through sort of four vehicles we try and do, we try and build, buy, uh, partner, and invest into new opportunities. Uh, so, uh, they do acquisitions, direct investments, and you can see our logo there, the Holvi logo. So, they've got direct uh, investments or acquisitions into Holvi. There's a bank called, a neo bank called Simple in the US. And then there's a, a payment provider called OpenPay in Mexico. That's the most recent acquisition. And also, uh, BBVA owns a stake in, in Atom, which is again one neo bank in, uh, in the UK. Then they do partnerships. And, uh, and again, being a large company, you can do partnerships with large companies, you can do partnerships with small companies, but your assets are going to be interesting uh, to, to a lot of partners. And similarly, a lot of partners' assets are going to be interesting to you. So there's a, there's a way of, of actually uh, combining forces uh, in many cases. Then BBVA does internal ventures. They have their uh, entrepreneurs, in, entrepreneurs in residence programs. They have their startup foundry. So what they do is they have seed investments, and then they, they have a certain period of time during which these, uh, these internal startups have to show their value, have to show market traction, and then they start investing into them, similarly uh, to what a VC would do. But these are in, inside the company. Again, leveraging a lot of the assets and expertise of, of the company. And then finally, there is uh, an investment fund called uh, uh, Propel, which invests into fintech companies. This investment fund operates as, a, as an arm's length uh, independent investment fund, but it also brings to, um, to BBVA access to these uh, uh, fintech startups, access to information, access to what is happening, and uh, in that way provides a, a good window to uh, where the world is going and, and what are the, the more interesting uh, startups. So it's really about building, uh, buying, uh, partnering and investing into the broader uh, ecosystem. So as you can see our logo there, let's go and dive a little deeper into what we do. So we're a payment institution. It means that we're a regulated entity, regulated by uh, Finanssivalvonta, FinFSA. Uh, we have a payment institution license that allows us to do, to, to, to provide um, uh, payment accounts to our customers and to, in those payment accounts, they can uh, transact, they can, they can do payments uh, in and out of those accounts. <clears throat> it's a lighter version of a credit institution, which is also called a bank. Credit institutions on top of, 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 of a payment institution can also take in deposits and then uh, lend them, lend the money. So the typical uh, balance sheet business that banks do is not allowed to payment institutions. Payment institutions are, are just focusing on the, on the, on the money transfers. We are uh, offering services only uh, through online, uh, so we don't have any branches, no physical places where you can go. And, uh, and we are uh, currently open in Germany, Austria, and Finland. And the cool thing about being a payment institution inside European Union is that we can passport the license that we have uh, acquired in Finland to other countries. So we don't have to apply for a license in Germany or in Austria, or in any other EU country uh, uh, for us to roll out services in those countries. And that is actually one of the reasons why BBVA was so interested in, uh, in Holvi, is that we are a lightweight organization that can roll out services and learn uh, from, uh, from different markets inside the EU in a, in a different way than uh, BBVA could ever do. And we've been part of BBVA's new digital business unit that I just introduced to you uh, since March 2016, so a little over a year. 
another reason why BBVA was interested in us is, and and the reason why why we're actually doing what we're doing is that we're focusing on a on a growing segment of micro entrepreneurs. Micro entrepreneurs we define as companies that are from zero to nine employees, and uh, and those uh, companies actually contribute uh, to. Uh, if 85% of, uh, of all new jobs are created by micro-businesses and SMEs, out of that 85, over 90% are these micro-businesses. So almost, almost all of that 85% of new businesses inside the EU, that are be, uh, new, new jobs that are created, are created in, uh, in micro-businesses. If you look at Finland, uh, there was a, a, a statistic from Suomen Yrittäjät, which, which actually showed that there, during uh, <coughs> the past 10 years, roughly uh, 30,000 jobs have disappeared from companies over 1,000 uh, employees. And at the same time, 30,000 new jobs have been created in, uh, in companies that are less than 10 employees. So there's a, there's a real shift, significant shift happening from people actually uh, working for large co corporations now moving into smaller units, and these uh, sorry yeah. Excellent question. So why are why is this happening? There are at least four trends. One of the trends is that uh, large companies are are for agility uh, to manage uncertainty. They are outsourcing a lot of their functions. So they're making people redundant. They're just pushing people out. They're saying, hey, you communication specialist, uh, you know, we're going to give you a package and, and, and uh, we want you to uh, resign, and, uh, but we can buy your services back so that you know, when they've got the money, they can actually leverage this communication specialist's skills. And when there's a, a tight moment, you know, the quarter isn't going according to plan, they can sort of, uh, you know, reduce spending easily. So they're trying to try to find this agility, and, and that's one trend. The other trend, of course, is, is the trend that, that all of you guys uh, are experiencing, which is the, this entrepreneurship, uh, I don't know, hype, or, or, you know, people, millennials, I think 66% of millennials in one study said that they're, gonna, they're, they're planning on starting their own business. So people actually want to be uh, working for themselves or for their friends, not don't want to don't want to necessarily be working for a large corporation. Then there are some people who just have to make ends meet, so they get a second job. So they do one job, a day job, and then they do another job. They do freelancing for for someone else as a second job. And uh, and and then there are these people who are who are sort of building a uh, a business out of their hobby. And, uh, and these people, um, that, that group is increasing as well uh, because of the internet and the ability to actually sell whatever you're doing across the globe uh, and, and you know, the tools that make it relatively easy to start your own business. They spend 6.8 hours on average on financial management, and that's on average. So, you know, some people spend a couple of hours. There were a lot of people who spent more than 10 hours a week on stuff that is not directly related to what they actually want to do. You know, they want to they're passionate about their hobby that they're turning into a business or they're passionate about their startup or they need to make ends meet and they're passionate about making that money, but they don't want to spend time on filing receipts on trying to figure out, you know, what is going on in my business. They just want to do the business. EU legislation, things like the payment institutions Things like PSD2, the Payment Services Directive 2, which is coming, which is opening up uh, the market for competition, is of course encouraging this. So this trend is actually going to be just enforced by, by uh, changes in regulation. And one of the things behind this regulation is actually to drive uh, more growth in the SME sector. So there's a big market for, uh, for these micro entrepreneurs, which is growing. What we're doing is, is we're providing a simple to use online service for these micro entrepreneurs. On one hand, to collect money from their customers, either to send invoices or to set up a very, very uh, uh, simple web shop. 
so they can collect revenue. And once they've collected revenue, then they need to pay bills. We also provide the other side, uh, the, the kind of the uh, account payable side. We provide ways uh, that they can pay their bills, follow what the, what the bill, what, what bills have been paid. They get alerts if, if uh, some of the due dates are over. And, and in other words, they get kind of a ledger of, of their, uh, their uh, account, re account receivables, so the money coming in, and their account payables in a very simple fashion. And then they have reports that they can uh, provide to their uh, accountant. And th this statement is from a, from a phone call or email, either phone call or email, from, from one of the potential customers asking us, so, you know, explaining what, what their problem was. It, it was a barber shop. Uh, and uh, they were saying that right now it feels like time and money is wasted on a lot of paperwork. So, again, that 6.8 hours of work. And uh, I still have unclarity about my business because the only view I get to my business is the accounting view. And the accounting view is always at least one month behind. So what the service that we're, uh, uh, we're offering is, is, is giving you is a real-time view on what's coming in, what's going out, and tools for getting money in, and then tools uh, for paying your bills. One of the tools being the, uh, the MasterCard that we've attached to the account. Yes? Uh, it must have been in one of the, the, the studies that we have uh, we've looked at. I don't remember which study. It's, it's just a number that uh, when, <clears throat> when we were uh, researching how much time is there, uh, is, is spent, it's probably one of these uh, European studies. So, in other words, what we do, we provide the collection tools, online store, invoicing. Uh, we provide tools for paying bills, so just normal bank transfers inside Europe, uh, and the, the bi uh, business MasterCard. And with the MasterCard, when you pay, all of the, uh, the, the transactions are actually filed into your uh, Holvi account. So, provides simple, real-time view on your businesses that you can then export uh, to your accountant. So, this is Holvi. So, how does BBVA then work with, with, with its portfolio companies? They give us a high degree of autonomy. Uh, we are managed by a board just like a VC would manage a, a, a company. And when I say high degree of autonomy, it's similar to a VC board guiding the, the, the venture on strategy, but not really sort of diving into the everyday decision making of, of the company. And I, I like that very much being the CEO of, uh, of, of, of one of these companies. I think it's, uh, it's a good, clean way of, of managing. Uh, they also, want to have many of these companies because there's no single approach to digitalization. So in other words, it needs to be a portfolio of internal ventures, of acquisitions, and then to see uh, what the, the other fintech uh, uh, companies are doing through this um, uh, venture fund. Uh, and the plan and the idea is to share competencies across the portfolio. So, for example, there is a there is an internal venture that's been set in in the U.S. set up in the U.S. focusing on the same segment uh, that we are. The CEO of, of that venture flew over to Finland. Uh, we explained what we're doing. He explained what he's doing. We're sharing basically learnings, and and that way also speeding up the learning. And uh, and of course they're taking a long term perspective on things. You cannot change a bank. You cannot change the industry in a second, although sometimes it feels when, you've, when you're in the middle of the disruption that everything is changing. However, things do take time to change, and uh, they, are, they are advocating the long-term perspective. In other words, learnings are important. Of course, revenue generation is important, but learnings are, are equally important. And especially, how can we help the bank transform its core business? How can those learnings be taken into the core business? And grow and support, not integrate. It's again about having the conservers and the changers and not trying to pull them too tightly together. Yeah. yeah so the question I had was regarding one and five, because I think there could also be two kinds of conflicts when you consider one and two. So 
how are the decisions, strategic decisions taken if you, for example, don't share the same vision as Holby than the vision that uh, the bank has in this case to hire another company? How do you deal with these kind of uh, situations in which there could be a mismatch that in your vision for long term? That is an excellent question. And the reason that is an excellent question is that I've just spent today with my chairman uh, and with a couple of other board members and with my management team doing strategy. And what, the way we're doing strategy, it's, a, it's sort of a midpoint review, is that we look at what are the key strategic questions. Not my chairman nor the management team knows what's going to happen in the future, but we know what are the things that need to be answered in order for us to win. And so, so what we're doing is we're actually defining those questions. And once we have an agreed set of questions, then what we do is we follow how we provide learnings on those questions, how we actually validate uh, the assumptions that we made. Uh, and, and you need to agree on, on that set of questions. Otherwise, you're going to end up in that sort of um, dissonance uh, th that you just described, where <clears throat> our vision is different from the owner's vision. And as with every company, of course, at the end of the day, the owner's view <laughs> is the prevailing view. That's why people have bosses. That's why I have the chairman. He gets paid to provide the right answers in, in times of doubt. But I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, I'll come back to what, how you actually manage that in, uh, in reality. When looking at the, the equation from the other side, so how do we grow with uh, BBVA? We know and understand our customers better than anybody else. We have information over power in that sense, over anybody else. If we focus, if we do our job right, we know what our segment, the segment that the bank is interested in, needs and wants. And I think there lies the, the, the way in, in which you communicate to your board. You tell to your board about the, what, what's happening in the market, what the customers want. And of course, you build your case so that it is built on that data, what the customers want. And if you've got that data, if it points directly to what the customers want, then the only thing the bank can say or the, the chairman can say is, of course, you need to do that. If we're still focusing on that particular segment, so it's if we're still part of the strategy. Then, as I said, sometimes in big companies, strategies change. I remember at Nokia, Nokia decided to get out of the enterprise solutions. So it was only a consumer company after that decision. We had a number of, of, uh, of uh, ventures working in the enterprise space. But after that, of course, those enterprise uh, ventures needed to be sort of stopped or divested because the, you know, it didn't any, any more make uh, sense for the company to be focusing and, and to be learning uh, in, in those markets. Uh, sorry. Well, first of all, the reason that they are interested or, or were interested and, and, and are, are, you know, continuing the, the, the work with us is exactly that. We are, uh, we are a possibility to open uh, markets and to learn about markets in those markets where they're not. And of course, Europe for a, a Spanish bank is an important market uh, overall. So it's a way for them to learn. And, uh, and where, uh, with regards to, to learning from the other, um, uh, other markets, like LATAM, where, where uh, BBVA is strong, uh, I think it's, to, to some extent, it's, it's important. But for a very focused uh, venture, we, we, we don't want to learn about those markets yet. We may want to learn about 
pricing models. We may want to learn about how to build proper risk models, so more generic things uh, from the bank rather than, than learning about a particular customer set in a particular country that, that is not within our scope, at least uh, right now. So I would say that, that getting, getting information from them on, uh, on, on more generic level is, is the way we leverage their, their uh, uh, skills. <coughs> and, and then we provide them with a more uh, market-specific data. We can, we can build better services faster and for the long term being backed by, by this, uh, this uh, large corporation, gain credibility. And, uh, and one thing that's very, very interesting is that we can also, partnering with them, have a full range of, uh, of banking products. So if you remember, we're a payment institution. We're not allowed to do all of the things banks can. They have the knowledge and the capabilities, and they can bring some of, that, uh, some of those capabilities to uh, to have a, a to, for us to provide a, a wider portfolio of products. May I ask a question here? Yes. Uh, full range of banking products, uh, but a few slides before uh, there was a mentioning that uh, you or Holby provides uh, SEPA SEPA hmm. payments, hmm. and I guess I also looked at the website. You don't provide possibility for other international payments. Does it mean that uh, in order to become a user, uh, a client needs to have both a banking account and Holvi uh, service to be like a, uh, to be able to, to, to make payments outside SEPA area? Uh, if 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 your business requires you to do uh, pay, uh, to to make payments to uh, outside SEPA area, then in in that sense, yes. Yes, we do SEPA bank transfers. Yeah. So, learning so far. I'll try and sum up learnings not just from, from, uh, from the BBVA, but from my background. And, uh, and the things that I listed here when I thought, so what is it that, that I've learned is that on the corporate side, on the big company side, if you want to do proper proper uh, new business set up. Uh, it all starts with the chairman. I used to think that it starts with the CEO, but I don't think so. The CEO, of course, uh, does what the board approves in terms of executes the strategy that the board has approved. And uh, if the strategy says you're supposed to allocate a certain part of the company resources into new business, then you've got something you can lean on. So it starts with the board, and especially in many cases, it starts with the chairman. We happen to have in BBVA a chairman who is very strong on reinventing the, the, the banking business. He thinks, he says, he believes that the banking business is going to be changing. There are tens of thousands of banks that he calls called in one uh, interview uh, analog banks, and there's only going to be a handful of digital banks after the transformation. And he believes, and he, of course, wants BBVA to be one of them. So having a strong direction in terms of transformation and new business building from the chairman is where it all starts from. The other really important thing is to have concrete corporate targets. So you, you need to be able to tell, not necessarily to the stock market, but in, internally inside the company, what are we trying to achieve? Is it? 500 million of, of new revenue in five years? Or is it uh, 20 million of, uh, of bottom line in, in three years? Or is it a million new customers in markets that we haven't yet been to? So clear targets, what do you want? And then you've got smart people who will try and, uh, and, and, and get to those targets. In some of the companies I've worked, this has been very difficult because people said, you need to grow, you need to build new business but they haven't articulated, the, the, the senior management hasn't articulated how much you need to build. You know, what is the, the, the size of, uh, of the effort? And it needs to be a continuous effort over years. It can't change from quarter to quarter, from, uh, from uh, one moment to another. Manage ventures independently, but target synergies. Again, we are independently managed through our board. However, we look for synergies with other portfolio companies. And I think it's important that, that 
there there are some synergies learning business wise or otherwise that the, the the portfolio companies have and share balance maintainers and changers i've been talking about the cons conservers the polishers and then the changers you need to have a little bit of both inside a corporate venture uh because you need to be able to talk to your uh your uh owner to the people inside the bank you need to be able to pull their expertise in you need to be able to talk their language it sounds ridiculous that they would have a separate language or a different language but it often is that they're talking in different terms they value different things and so forth and as i said mentioned earlier this term called boundary spanner these people who can talk both languages who translate uh between uh, over the border of new business and existing business are really important and incentivize growth the the one thing that that is expected of this new business ventures is growth because in terms of size you're never going to make it uh into the top 10 or top 3 of uh, of the company's priorities because the big businesses are by definition bigger than you are however if you can show double digit growth quarter on quarter uh year on year uh, you all of a sudden start becoming very interesting because people are looking at their own business saying, oh, my business isn't growing that fast. What are these guys doing? And then they get interest. So that actually bridges me to the venture side. So if you're in one of the ventures like we are in, in, in Holvi, be strategic, i.e. grow. It, will, it may not save you from the strategy change that, that every once in a while happens. But if you're growing, you're at least uh, relevant in, in that sense. Don't hype. Hype hurts. When you're a startup, you need to hype. You need to be able to huff and puff and make yourself bigger than you are because you need to raise money. When you're in a, in a corporate environment, you've kind of done the deal already in terms of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of selling yourself. Now you need to sell yourself through numbers and actions and what really is happening. That's what people are going to be following on. They're going to be looking at your KPIs, not, on, not your press releases. When in doubt, go to customer for focus. I think somebody asked, you know, how, what if you're in conflict with what the, the big corporation wants and, uh, and, and what your business should be doing? Always, always focus on customer at that point. Always get your power from customer. Always justify your decisions and your direction through what the customers want. If you can do that, then you're, you know, you're, you're so much better off because there will always be somebody who will try and say, you know, I, I think you should be doing this so that it benefits my part of the business or, or something like that. And if it doesn't, and you can't justify why you're disagreeing through your own business goals and through your customer needs, uh, it's going to be so much uh, more difficult. Learn fast, implement only what you know. You, the, the, one, the one thing that you have uh, in, uh, in in, in, bis in, in small businesses is lack of resources. So you can't really implement uh, a lot of stuff. You have to know what you want to do. Do little things, small steps, and, uh, and learn fast. And be agile. Try and be, be able to change direction, but try and leverage the big machine. There's one slide, and, th and again, Learning, I've, I've said learning so many times in this presentation that it's starting to sound like I'm repeating myself, but this is kind of the, the, the one thing where I'm, I'm distilling everything that I've learned. And, uh, you know, this is called the Thought Leaders Program. Uh, not sure whether I'm a thought leader, but the, the one thing that, that I really think matters is that there are the, the only sustainable competitive advantage is to be able to learn faster than your competition and to be able to implement those learnings faster than they do. So it's two questions, and these are the questions I keep asking myself, I keep asking my team, I, I encourage my board to ask me is, what have you learned since we last met? And then after that, so what are you gonna do about it? What have you learned and what are you gonna do about it? I think if you can get that loop going faster than anybody else, then you're going to win. And there's nobody who, who can beat you. All right. That was that. Thank you very much for listening. And thank you very much for very good questions. Uh, I think we're done. Yeah.
Thank you, Antti Jussi. We have time for a couple of questions and actually those who asked question today is special day for you. You get a AVP hoodie. So after the event, let's go to AVP sp space and get those hoodies. So I think we have time for a couple of questions again. And if you ask a great question, you get a hoodie. So there we start from there. Throw it. <clears throat> Hello. Yes. So you briefly mentioned Bitcoin uh, and uh, big data and some other things. So uh, my question regarding, uh, I have actually, uh, yeah, this uh, little complicated question. Uh, first is that, uh, do you think that uh, Bitcoin is going to somehow hugely disrupt this payment market uh, in the near future? And near future, I mean like next two to three years. And uh, I have another question regarding like uh, this uh, Facebook uh, and so on, uh, but as like uh, instant messenger services payment, and does w is it going to have a disruptive impact in uh, next two to three years? Yes. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> if I say no, and then somebody's gonna watch the video, then everybody's gonna think what an idiot. If I say yes. <laughs> <laughs> and if somebody watches this in two years, they're going to say, what an idiot. I, I can't win. <laughs> I Honestly, honestly, that one slide about financial industry being disrupted, the, the third box, I think, is a big question mark. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I, I know that one thing I know for sure is mm -hmm. that things are not going to be the same they were yesterday. Things yeah. are moving constantly forward. So anybody who tells you that that the change that's happening in a particular industry is going to happen like it happened in another industry is lying because mm -hmm. that would be just huge luck mm -hmm. because there are so many moving things that are are, are taking things forward. Mm -hmm. So in, in terms of Bitcoin, I wish I knew. Uh, I think it's going to change. It's going to change the way um, uh, financial services uh, and financial industries operating. But how will it change? Yeah, will it happen in two years? Will it happen in five years? <laughs> I, I really don't know. <laughs> this is the key question. I know. I know. <laughs> if I knew, I'd probably be uh, running a startup with you. <laughs> <laughs> and the other question, was, which is messaging services. Yes. Well, yes. we see what well, we see. What's happening? What's coming out of China? And I think that that these big boys need to react. WeChat, WeChat and yeah. Tencent and so on. They have like uh, dis, uh, disrupted at least Chinese banking sector quite yes. significantly. Yes. But the same thing is not happening in Europe and United States and in Western world because of the different uh, regulation structure. But this regulation structure is changing. So I'm 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 certain that the big brands that you saw on that slide as examples mm. of leveraging uh, deregulation mm. are going to get into this area one way or another. Mm. So if you think about the, the big names, they've already tried a couple of times. Mm. <clears throat> I don't think that they're going to stop trying. Mm. I think that payments are such an integral part of customer experience in different services mm. that you, you, the better you can integrate them mm. as, as part of your service, the more traction you're going to have. Uh, uh, for that service, and and the you know the more happy customers you're gonna have, so so definitely they're gonna do something, but again, I don't know what. Yeah, so I was curious how open is this information exchange between the venture companies. So let's say for example, Atom and Holvi, how much information do you consider is worth exchanging between each other, or could be for example strategic that you don't want to share? or even indirectly through the parent company, how open are you in exchanging information? Well, I think with Atom, Atom being a, a bit of a different beast because the uh, BBVA holds a, a minority investment, so we're at 29%, if I remember correctly. Uh, of course, there, the, the um, uh, kind of the, the, the corporate uh, uh, sort of uh, policies uh, prevent them from sharing everything with us uh, because, you know, it's a, it's only partially owned owned by BBVA. But if I take another example, if I take any of the ventures, in, in, internal ventures, uh, if I take Simple, which is a a, a fully owned uh, a bank in uh, 
in in the US, uh, we do share. I, actually, Josh, who runs Simple, is on my board, so he gets to see everything that that happens in in my company. We share constantly information on things like user acquisition, on conversions, uh, stuff like that. So it's it it is pretty open, and of course, you can do that when you're inside. The, the same company. What you can do, as I said, is is of course share as openly with with people at Atom. But they're they're a cool bunch. I think they, you know, we we do get to to share some uh, some data with them as well. Can you grab um, just curious, what kind of talents are you going to need more, and what kind of talents are you going to need less? Uh, mm, well. You, you, you saw the technologies on, on, on that financial industry being disrupted slide and, uh, and things like uh, machine learning, of course, are things that, that everybody needs to start focusing on to improve the, the user experience, uh, to make things more automatic. Uh, uh, cloud computing is, is something that, that, you know, if we talk about technical skills, that's something that, that we will uh, be needing more of uh, as we scale up. Um, I think that currently the 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 god of the universe almost you know that the person who can decide where they go are these full full stack developers, so they 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 kind of decide what they want to do and where they want to work and uh, and and it's they're they're like the the unicorns very difficult to catch so so any full stack developers uh, uh, we would definitely most definitely need need uh, one or two of those. Uh, in in terms of technology, then of course uh, on the on the marketing side, you know uh, we will be building partnerships in in the new markets where we where we go, and we will be ha need, we will need to have local experience there. Um, I think that's that's probably so technology pieces pieces right now, and and then uh, in terms of, of marketing and channel building is is the other area where where we will need people in the future. Let's take two final questions. I think you were first. Be nice of you. Okay. Uh, actually, I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you because I ran into Holvi through my carpenter, and since then I have opened three web shops, and it had, has been delightful to use it. So well, thank you. Well, thank you for being a customer. Thank you. Nice to hear. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to know um, where are you operating currently? And then also if you've heard about uh, the huge boom regarding uh, payment system, be it mobile in Africa, or if you have any thoughts about what is going on in Africa regarding payment system, or you're just doing what others are doing. Okay, uh, another very difficult question. I absolutely know nothing else than M-Pesa in, in Africa. So that's what I've heard of, uh, of uh, I've read articles on. Uh, I don't know how, how payments are, are developing in Africa. Um, we are uh, currently uh, in EU, in, uh, in Germany, in Austria, in Finland, uh, and will, for the time being, be focusing on the EU markets because of the the payment uh, institution license that allows us to passport our regulated license across uh, EU. So there's tens of millions of uh, target customers for us there. I think it'll take us a little while. All right. Thank you, everyone. Let's give a giant hand to Antip. <laughs>